Well, well, good evening. I'm coming to you on March 21st with my almost nightly uh, views on the situation in the Ukraine. Well, the situation is static. The Russians have not moved. They have not gained any ground. There are a lot of Ukrainian uh, counteroffensives, localized counteroffensives, and I've been um, told and, uh, and I've seen uh, that the Russians have suffered tremendous uh, casualties and tremendous loss of material. Uh, I don't know if the Ukrainian estimates are correct, but they're talking about 15,000 dead Russians, just dead, which would indicate something like 45,000 wounded. Uh, that's an extraordinary number, and if it's anything close to that, it's a disaster for the Russian military. Well, I, and, and I don't think the Russians can resupply for the reasons that I stated last night. I think the uh, Russian military numbers are inflated to allow for corruption following the dead souls uh, formula. I think that the oligarchs and defense ministry officials have been raiding the military budget for years. I don't think Russia can resupply effectively. I don't think they have the manpower. I don't think they have the equipment. Uh, so I think the Russians are in for a very nasty uh, resolution to this uh, war that they've unleashed. And um, so that the, I do expect this, uh, the situation to be resolved uh, within 10 days uh, in some type of negotiated peace or some negotiated agreement. It may be temporary, though, because the, the Ukrainians are going to feel generational hatred for the Russians. This is not something that Ukraine will forget very quickly or forgive ever. And if uh, you know Putin's actions have not only made him a pariah, they've actually contradicted his basic ideology, this idea of a greater Russian nation, a third Rome, uh, Ivan Ilyin's uh, idea of uh, Russia's uh, historic uh, mission. Uh, I think that that has been reversed by Putin's actions, which have made him a most, you know, uh, a, a, such a hated individual that he takes a position now among Stalin, among Hitler, at that level of cruelty and barbarity. So I don't think, I think he is probably killed his dream of a greater Russia uh, or a new Russia. Uh, this is, uh, I think that uh, Putin acted on this ideology. I think that he made his decision to invade Ukraine based on this ideological uh, viewpoint. And uh, he has destroyed the viability of his narrative, of his philosophical um, point of view. Uh, certainly in the Ukraine, it, it will be rejected for generations. Russians may be rejected for generations. And I fear that there may be some retaliation taken against uh, the Russian speakers in the Donbass. But if you're a separatist in the Ukraine and you're a Russian separatist who wants to live under Russia, there is a place where you can go. It's not that far. And it's called Russia. You should, and separatism is a bad idea, and it's, uh, it is uh, when uh, uh, exploited by great powers, it can lead to uh, great conflicts. You can argue that the Serbian irredentism or separatism in uh, 1914 led to the First World War, a disaster for all of Europe. And uh, while this may not reach the levels of the First World War, it certainly can, uh, has the potential to escalate and, and draw other nations into the struggle. Although I do think that the, uh, that the Putin war machine has been uh, shown for what it is, a hollow Goliath, an empty threat, and one should not be terribly afraid of Putin's conventional weapons. He does have, unfortunately, a significant nuclear arsenal. And that makes him always dangerous. I don't think he'll use nuclear weapons. I think he would be stopped before he does. And at that point, maybe eliminated. 
be, because uh, the Russian military and uh, you know his power base doesn't seem to be suicidal, and he doesn't seem to be suicidal. He knows what it would mean to use nuclear weapons. I think he would for uh, he would threaten, and he would try to find to get some leverage by nuclear blackmail. But he would never. Uh, he would never actually use these weapons. I'd like to turn to the diplomatic side of this, or legal side of this conflict. And, uh, I, you know, it, it is a violation of Russian uh, obligations since, the, since signing the uh, UN Charter in 1946. Um, and it certainly violates the principles uh, of the uh, 1975 Helsinki Accords or Helsinki uh, Final Act, uh, certainly Ar Article 3, which guarantees the territorial inviolability of nation states, and uh, Article 8, which recognizes the rights of people for self-determination, something that the Ukrainians did in 1991. Uh, you can argue that this was a pre- uh, Russian Federation agreement, and it doesn't bind Putin, but there was the subsequent uh, 1990, 1991 uh, Paris Charter for a New Europe, where these principles, the Helsinki, uh, the 10 principles of the Helsinki Final Act were enshrined as part of a new um, agreement in the Charter, uh, Paris Charter for a New Europe. And Russia signed that. It was the uh, Russian Federation at the time. And those principles obviously have been violated in, in, in the case of Ukraine, in the case of Georgia, uh, in the case of Chechnya. So Russia uh, has violated uh, accords. They don't reach uh, the uh, binding uh, quality or character of a treaty, but they still are respected and adhered to in international law. And then you have the, um, the 1994 Budapest Memorandum where Ukraine gave up its sizable nuclear arsenal in exchange for, for uh, guarantees by Russia, by the United States to um, guarantee its territorial inviolability. Uh, that has been violated so that the uh, Ukrainians gave up their nuclear arsenal in exchange for these guarantees. These guarantees were ignored by Putin's savage, immoral, illegal attack on the Ukrainian people. Uh, and then uh, um, you had uh, the founding document, NATO-Russia founding document in 1997, that basically allowed Russia agreed to the enlargement to um, NATO's uh, enlargement and uh, held itself as an ally, uh, agreed to cooperate fully with NATO as NATO enlarged. And Russia and Boris Yeltsin at the time signed this agreement, recognizing the right of NATO to uh, bring in other nations. Uh, and then now Putin, of course, uh, claims that this was the uh, the, the issue that broke the camel's back, that he had to invade because NATO was a threatening force on the borders of Russia. Well, NATO has never really threatened Russia, uh, except as a defensive alliance. Um, it's, you know, not a threat. It is only a threat because it, it encompasses democratic nations, and Putin is afraid of democratic nations because they tend to be more prosperous, uh, freer, and generally people want to live in those societies rather than closed authoritarian repressive states. And Putin um, has a problem with that. So Putin violated at least three agreements, maybe four, maybe five, if you take the UN Charter, so that the issues that Putin brings up are uh, in direct violation of uh, international law. So Putin has violated uh, the law of nations. Uh, and indeed, uh, it, uh, President Zelensky uh, offered not to join NATO, as Putin had said initially that his main objective in this 
uh, war was, of course, special operations, uh, was uh, to prevent uh, Ukraine from joining NATO and becoming a threat to Russia. Uh, that is pl blatantly false. Uh, Stephen Kopkin, the great um, historian at uh, Princeton University and biographer of Joseph Stalin, and I, I do uh, recommend his, uh, at least the two volumes that he already has published, the third volume coming uh, as the definitive biography of Stalin. Kotkin argues that in, in a talk on this, on this war, that Putin has adopted much of the Stalinist adventurism that was evident. Uh, Kotkin mentioned in 1950, allowing uh, Kim Il-sung to invade South Korea. Uh, he basically argues that there's a parallel between Stalin's um, that kind of proxy war in Korea and this war that Putin has unleashed in, um, in Ukraine. Uh, Kotkin makes, uh, dismisses the argument that NATO was a threat uh, and basically places blame where it should be placed on the head of Putin. Uh, I think Putin has begun his long goodbye, but uh, unfortunately for the Ukrainian people, it may take months so that more civilians will die, unfortunately. But at the end of the day, Ukraine will win. Okay, so long.